It is indeed a pleasure to have all of you with us this morning. A warm welcome to you. Mr. Kant, thank you so much for doing this, attending this session at the National Management Con Convention. Mr. Kant, as all of us know, is one of the most articulate spokesmen for the government. He has been outstanding as a PM Sharpa at G20. He has become a global star at the G20 summit in Delhi, getting the summit to sign the declaration that was hailed by all. He looks after India's interests in the most powerful forum, which accounts for 80% of GDP and 75% of its trade, and has shown India the way to punch up above its weight. One of India's most recognizable bureaucrats, your capacity for policy and projection has made brands out of government schemes. He is synonymous for God's own country, incredible India, for really lifting tourism, then moving on to start up in India, make in India, and many more government campaigns that have resulted in great outcomes. While each ministry is responsible for a certain portfolio, Mr. Kant is like an overarching thread that connects all of them. He brings, therefore, a very broad perspective from tourism to manufacturing on, and on the environment as well as skilling. Everything that is needed for the India of tomorrow. He goes beyond linear thinking and more importantly, as a leader, he builds consensus. It is hard to find an individual with that breadth and depth, and we are extremely fortunate to have him with us today. Today we are privileged to have you to discuss how India can, give, can fire the afterburners of next generation reform. Its economic growth must, must be even higher. So my gratitude to you and a very warm welcome for today's session. Balaji, it is a pleasure to have you, and thank you for agreeing to deliver the concluding remarks. You have been a, an outstanding corporate affairs professional, and your services at Nokia, Vodafone, and now Air India are well recognized and appreciated. A warm welcome to you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Indian economy has recovered strongly to achieve 8% growth. And the government has put a lot of impetus into this, into this growth by investments and welfare spending. India's large companies are in very good shape now, as you would have witnessed from papers, profitability, and GDP growth. The environment is absolutely right for private investment in industrial capacity as well as in new technologies. Consumer spending, too, has remained strong in spite of inflation spikes. So, therefore, the economic confidence in the country is very high. However, nothing is really ever linear. Growth rates spike and dip, and changes are bound to happen, especially in today's dynamic with market shifting, regulation, technology, and, of course, geopolitics. The economy needs constant nurturing to keep growing. Every now and then, new growth engines have to be added, and innovation has to be crucial. Meanwhile, we have to look at our old growth engines and see how they can be retuned, fine-tuned, so they continue to grow and become relevant for the tomorrow of India. Today, India has reached a juncture where it can get more out of its land, labor, capital, and intellect. India could tweak its policies, rules, taxes, technologies to improve the country's productivity, value, and competitiveness. This is a time when India can turn pressures into profits by changing its perspective and priorities. For example, unemployment, the fact that we have a huge labor force. How do we use skilling to turn this to India's advantage? India's energy and material needs are relentless and growing. 
Yet India can shift to green energy products. It can shift, it can own supply chains and, transport and, and transportation and make it into an engine for growth. We are privileged to have Mr. Kant here, who has been involved in the future path for the economy as the CEO of Niti Aayog and who thinks deeply about the possibilities and strategies that we are looking forward to. We are definitely looking forward to his address on putting India's economies afterburners to work and make it move even faster. It is now my pleasure to invite Mr. Amitabh Kant to address the gathering. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sunita Reddy, uh, first of all, thank you for those very kind words. Uh, Mr. Balaji, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, truly delighted to be here. I've been asked to speak on after burner the next generation reforms. Ladies and gentlemen, last year, India grew at about 8.2 percent. We were the fastest growing large economy in the world. And today we are the fifth largest economy in the world. In the next three years, we'll overtake Japan and Germany to be the third largest economy in the world. In a world which is starved for growth, India is an outlier. And India has emerged as a very resilient powerhouse driving growth. India will be driving 20% of the world's economic growth in the next decade. What we are witnessing today is a once-in-a-generation shift in our economic position. Just a few years back, ladies and gentlemen, we were in the fragile five, and from the fragile five, we moved to the top five in a decade. Many of you would recall that we were facing a twin balance sheet problems. The banks had a non-performing asset on their one side, and the corporates were in debt. How was it solved? The government has carried out various structural reforms. The goods and services tax, the bankruptcy code, the RERA, cleaning up bank balance sheets, corporate tax was reduced, ease of doing business, radical changes were made. The government has pushed for digitization in a very big way, and today we do about close to 50% of the total real-time fast payment in the world. We've opened up our space, geospatial drone sectors in a very big way so that young startups can drive India's growth story. When the Startup India movement was started in 2016, there were just 350 startups. Today we have over 140,000 startups with over 140 unicorns. We've created a vast amount of infrastructure over the years. 40 million houses, close to about 35 million, uh, you know, houses have been built. We've 35 to 40 million houses. We've built up, provided electricity to every house. We've done about 88,000 kilometers of road. We've provided about 120 million toilets, about 253 million piped water connection. We've also taken a vast number of measures on going green in the climate air world. We've today have about 200 gigawatt of renewable energy. We brought down renewable energy price from 24 rupees to 2 rupees. We've provided clean cooking fuel to over 110 million women whose lives have been improved. We've actually brought down the prices of LED bulbs and of electric buses. And for India, net zero is net positive. We have de demonstrated to the world that by going green, India can do it at a green discount rather than at a green premium due to the size and scale of India. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenge is that we have to, by the time we become 12047, we have to become a $30 trillion economy with a per capita income of 18,000. Today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you are close to about a $4 trillion economy and your per capita income is close to about 2500
Now from 2,500, taking it to 18,000 per capita income and taking your GDP from 4, 4 trillion to 30 trillion means that you have to grow, your GDP has to grow nine times, nine times. And your per capita income has to grow eight times. And this would require, to my mind, this would require sustained growth of about 8 to 10 percent per annum for the next 30 years. Very few countries have managed to do this in the last 70 years. Japan did this during 1960 to 1990 in the post-World War II era. Later, between 1960 and 1990, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore did it. And between 1990 to 2010, China has done it. Now, when these countries were growing and expanding, global trade was growing. They grew on the back of exports. They penetrated global markets. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenge for India is that when the opportunity has arisen for India, there's a crisis in economic globalization. Global value chains are disrupted and protectionism has occupied center stage. <coughs> the recent U.S. imposition of duties, let's look at it, about 100% on EVs, 50% on semiconductors and solar panels on import from China. And there is an economic war on account of China subsidizing its industries and creating global oversupply. Look at, look at their global penetration. In solar PV panel, they occupy about 75% of the global share. In electric vehicles and components, they occupy 60% of the global share. In batteries, they occupy 70% of the global share. And all this is that because the state is subsiding, subsidizing their manufacturers and they are penetrating global markets. There are several other challenges which India is seeing today. There's a seismic shift in geopolitics. There's a return of great power conflict in the heart of Europe. You have a war going on for three years. Middle East is up in flames. There is a severe humanitarian crisis. And there's a great concern, a huge impact on food, fuel, and fertilizer. Ladies and gentlemen, there is also the emergence of new technologies. Artificial intelligence, data, machine learning, quantum computing, space, biotechnology. Now these technologies promise unprecedented productivity and wealth creation. But these technologies can also be misused to trigger conflict. And it's important that we have a pro-innovation policy which will drive growth and prosperity for the humanity. International regulations are necessary so that there is no misuse against humanity. So what we are seeing is a remarkable period of stability from the end of World War II through to the early 21st century has come to an end. We are in the midst of global challenges with India is planning to grow and expand. There are some other challenges which we need to realize domestically. The top 50% of our population actually creates growth it actually creates, secures well-paid jobs, it drives growth and prosperity. And the bottom 50% lives mainly in rural areas relying on agriculture, wage labor, or as government welfare schemes to achieve basic living standards. It is important that we transform uh, the lives of these people, the bottom 50%. If we were to have a 50% growing for prosperity and a 50% living on uh, wages in the agricultural sector alone and through government subsidies, that means India will grow only at 6%. This is good if we want to achieve 6% growth. But if we want to achieve 9 to 10% growth over three decades till 2047, we will need to transform the bottom 50% of India's income distribution from being passive beneficiaries of government welfare schemes to very active contributors to their personal and national growth. And this is what all of them want. They appreciate reliable delivery of food grains, but as the government has said, that, that it will drive growth and prosperity for all citizens. And that is why we had the aspirational district program, which based on outcomes really transformed the 115 districts of India. Based on that experience, my view is that we have to enhance productivity. And higher productivity requires high focus on human development index. 
It means that we have to improve social indicators, our learning outcomes, our health outcomes, and our skills. Uh, data shows that our learning outcomes leave a lot to be desired. You know, almost 35% of the students uh, under five are not able to solve, even when they are class in class 10, are not able to solve class 4 maths or even in their mother tongue or do physics or chemistry. And today, uh, you know, it's important to improve these learning outcomes and improve our health outcomes. And every country that has grown on a sustained basis of over 8% over a long period of time has actually had very high quality education with improved learning and health outcomes for its citizens. And therefore, it's very important that we should utilize our biggest advantage. And our biggest advantage lies in the demographic dividend. India is one of the youngest nations with a median age of 29. And this accounts for nearly 20% of the world's total population of youth. That means out of the total young population in the world, 20% of that population comes from India. So what do we need to do? What are the key reforms? What are the key challenges that we need to undertake? First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, I am a strong believer that if India is to grow at 9 to 10% over the next three decades and become a developed economy by 2047, we need to improve our learning outcomes, our health outcomes and our nutritional standards in a very big way. And this would mean that many of the states like Bihar and Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh and Rajasthan and MP, they account for almost 50% of our population and therefore uh, their share of agriculture, they, it is very critical that we transform them. It is important that they become the key uh, driver of improvement and human development index. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is also important that we focus on a very, very credible story of transforming states so that they grow in a very big way. We need to create, India can grow at 10 to 9 to 10 percent for three decades only and only if we have 10 to 12 champion states. If the states do not grow, it will not be possible for India to grow. And therefore, we need 10 to 12 champion states which are growing at 10 to 11 percent. Not merely Gujarat or Maharashtra or Tamil Nadu, but we need the eastern part of India to grow at rapid rates because the, they are highly populated. UP and Bihar together account for 25% of India's population. And therefore, if these states grow, you are transforming the lives of a vast segment of our population. And therefore, it is very important that these are states where agriculture employment is very high. It's over 55 to 60%. And which will account for 90% of the increase in working age population in the next 25 years. And therefore, we need to move a vast segment of our population from agriculture into manufacturing and into urbanization. And that is why the government has driven this new 12 industrial corridors so that we can create new cities of the future and in create new corridors of the future. And that will drive a higher share of industry in our GDP, which is very critical. The challenge is that our share of manufacturing is still hovering around 17.5 to 18 percent, whereas the countries which have driven growth, Japan, China, at the peak, the share of their manufacturing was 25 to 28 percent in the GDP. So we need to take manuf uh, drive our population from agriculture into manufacturing, into urbanization. And this would require us to create 500 new cities or 1 million each so that we need good quality urbanization, sustainable in urbanization, so that we create cities where there can be walk to work, which is manufacturing led, which is sustainable in nature. And therefore, to my mind, urbanization and manufacturing will, is the, one of the biggest challenges which India faces, which we'll have to drive. And to my mind, this would require us to bring in good governance in our municipality. Many of our cities, uh, what we are seeing today is a collapse of municipal governance and we need to focus on the quality of municipal governance. And secondly, ladies and gentlemen, the, my view is that India will be able to drive this if we are able to leverage technology to leapfrog. 
We need to innovate. We need to do R&D. We need to do patents, and we need to commercialize our patents. While our patents have grown enormously, last year we had almost a lack of patents. But the commercialization of these patents is still low. So the patents must lead to commercial products. They must get commercialized, and we must do quality patents which are leading to commercialization. Last year also, if you look at 2023, we've paid almost about 14.5 uh, billion as our outgo for payment royalties, whereas our uh, earnings outgo is our earnings is just about. Two billion. So our earnings is much less on royalties, whereas our outgo is much more. And what India needs to do to become is is an innovative nation which is able to take its technology to the rest of the world. And therefore, the government has initiated several new missions: the missions for artificial intelligence, the mission for quantum computing, the mission for green hydrogen. And many of these PLI schemes, the production-linked in incentive scheme, which will make, make India a manufacturing centre. Like yesterday, the cabinet approved the new e-drive PM e-drive scheme, so that we can drive elect uh, electrical vehicle manufacturing in India in a very big way and become a champion of electric vehicle manufacturing. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am a great believer that innovation, R&D, patents, commercialisation is critical, and the government has. Uh, brought in a 1 lakh crore scheme uh, so that it can work with the private sector uh, so to do greater R&D in cutting edge areas of growth and drive India as a great innovative nation. The next point I want to make is that it's necessary for India to go green. Energy transition is the key to the future. Today we import almost about 180 billion worth of fossil fuel. The ambition which the Prime Minister has spelt out is that by 2047, instead of being an importer of fossil fuel, we should be an exporter of green energy. No other country is more blessed than India as far as climatic conditions are concerned. We today do 200 gigawatt of renewable energy. The aim is to use this renewable, renewable energy to crack water and produce green hydrogen and become the cheapest producer of green hydrogen, the biggest exporter of green hydrogen and the cheapest manufacturer of electrolyzer in the world. And uh, to my mind, uh, take the price of green hydrogen, which is $4.5 per kilogram now, and bring it down to $1 per kilogram by 2047. And that will make India a champion of clean energy in, to, and exporting it, uh, green hydrogen, in its liquid form, ammonia, to the rest of the world. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have spelt out the need for social transformation, the need to have uh, a huge focus on human development, the need to create 10 to 12 champion of states, the need to have a very higher critical share of industry and uh, in manufacturing in our GDP, the need for urbanization and multiple government governance and particularly sustainable urbanization is the key, the need to leverage technology to leapfrog and the need to go green. And all this will only be possible if the states of India do what the government of India has done in terms of ease of doing business. They need to scrap rules and regulations and procedures and acts which were built during our socialistic era and become champions of change. Why I'm saying this is that if India is to grow, they have to be the champions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not merely India's decade, but India's century. India needs to unlock its vast potential, unleash private investment, and achieve sustained high growth in the coming decades. This will ensure prosperity for its citizens. And with prosperity, we must ensure a society which is vibrant, both culturally rich and harmonious. It's not merely GDP, but also the quality of life of citizens which will change. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure. Lisa. Uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan, G20 Sherpa of India, uh, Ms. Sunita Reddy, Senior Vice President Aima, and Managing Director, Apollo Hospitals Enterprise Limited, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is indeed my privilege to conclude this rather absorbing session. Mr. Khan, as always, thank you for an exciting keynote and for patiently explaining the potential of the next set of 
economic reforms. Your keynote was detailed and incisive, and we learned a lot about the government's thinking in bringing radical new reforms. Clearly, your passion and your vision for India is inspirational. It has always been a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sunita, I think your industry perspective was very lucid and positive. Uh, thank you for the uh, cordial welcome and for setting the context for the session. As a leader of India's foremost uh, healthcare chain, you are part of an industry that's very reliant on technology, infrastructure, and skilled labor. I'm quite certain that you, along with me and everybody else in this room, uh, we're quite enthused with what uh, Mr. Khan talked about, the intent of the government, not only at the central level, but to also kind of get the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the states to get, uh, become part of the entire uh, growth story for India. And indeed, these are very important points that you made. I think some uh, takeaways, and I won't even attempt to uh, uh, summarize everything that Mr. Khan said in those 20 minutes. Uh, he spoke a lot about uh, reforms and digitization, something that we also passionately believe in the industry are the critical uh, foundations on which India is going to grow going forward. Uh, uh, he also talked about uh, the, the, the steps that were taken in the last decade or decade and a half that have gotten to where our nation is today and also articulated the challenges ahead of us as we need to, uh, you know, girdle ourselves and prepare for the journey from uh, 4 trillion to 32 trillion or a per capita from $2,500 to $18,000 in less than 25 years. Uh, obviously, our, uh, we have some experiences uh, uh, to, to fall back on from, from other nations or from our own history, but truly the challenges are evident. It was spoken about in the first session as well, uh, about the global slowdown, geopolitics, protectionism, supply chain disruption, and so on. Uh, and of course, the opportunities and threat that new technology uh, uh, kind of brings uh, in front of all of us. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is clear to, to me, as, I, as I've heard him and others before, that there is a need for collective effort to drive the growth of all of India. And that's really the critical path. All of India is the uh, operative phrase out here. Uh, to drive that productivity, whether it's for learning outcomes or for skill outcomes or for health outcomes, it requires all of us to participate and it means that we need to be more inclusive as industry. It means that we need to be, uh, as a nation, more responsive to the needs of people that are crying out for being part of this uh, wonderful journey ahead of us for the next 25 years. I think Mr. Khan spoke about uh, the government's resolve. And I must say, from the industry point of view, we're equally committed to invest in the whole of the ecosystem. I know that's true about every one of our members here, whether it's in the healthcare sector or the aviation sector. We are saying that if there is nothing which is out here, if we need to go at the pace at which Indians want us to grow, the way uh, aspirations are growing in India, then we need to build the whole of the ecosystem, whether it's in skills, whether it's in the, in the case of training, whether it's about bringing a lot more people into the workforce and upskilling existing people. And that's a commitment that as industry, as management, we take very seriously. And as IMA, we hugely committed to that. Whether it's large corporates, whether it's entrepreneurs, all of us in the country need to contribute and innovate and build the future that, uh, that is uh, ahead of us and to seize the opportunities. And in that sense, I would say that IMA brings all of those forces together for a collaborative conversation, whether it's the industry, whether it's entrepreneurs, large corporates, MSME, or for that matter, government policy makers. And I'm quite optimistic that the next, uh, with the next uh, generation reforms coming in, industry will do what is required to be done, entrepreneurs will do what is required to be done to get us to the ambition of Vikasit Bharat in 2047. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience and for your attention.